Halifax, more than any other Canadian city, has experienced war throughout its history. In 1749, Halifax was established as a strategic port for the British Navy in the midst of the war between England and France for control of North America. Each day at the Halifax Citadel, the noon gun is fired. It has been said that the guns of the Citadel have never been fired in anger, yet the fortified town of Halifax was always the key to British rule in North America. In 1749, Lord Cornwallis, the first governor of Halifax, ordered his regiments to take or destroy the Micmac, whose ancestors had inhabited the land for thousands of years. A reward of ten guineas was offered for each Micmac scalp. In 1755, as a preparation for war against France, the British governor of Halifax ordered the expulsion of 8,000 Acadians who were descendants of the original French settlers in the colony, despite their agreement to remain neutral. British warships then sailed from Halifax to defeat the French at Louisbourg in 1758 and Quebec City in 1759. In following years, the British used Halifax as a naval base to attack the Americans during the War of Independence and again during the War of 1812. Successive British campaigns from 1749 to 1815 had made war the most lucrative business of all for the merchants of Halifax who supplied the British fleets. In contrast to the fortunes made from war, much of the population was impoverished and slavery was part of life in Halifax. The Citadel, which looms over Halifax Harbor, has seen thousands leave to fight and die for the British Empire. In 1900, troops departed Halifax for South Africa to fight for British colonial interests in the Boer War. During the First World War, over 350,000 Canadians shipped from Halifax to the bloody battlefields of Europe. On December 6, 1917, in a Halifax harbour that was crowded with wartime convoys, a Belgian relief ship collided with the Mont Blanc, a French munitions ship overloaded with 32,000 tons of high explosives. The result was the worst man-made explosion before Hiroshima. Two thousand citizens were killed and 10,000 injured. One half the population of 50,000 was left homeless. During World War I, the British military directly administered the port of Halifax. They had allowed the Mont Blanc and its deadly cargo into the middle of Halifax Harbor without precautions. A big explosion in the boats. The three boats that were coming up the harbor went, they exploded and blew up the whole city. It wasn't anything about the building. It was, it was in these boats, whatever it was, you know. They, had, they were carrying some kind of material for the war. That's what it was. And it blew up. And we just stood there. We did not know. And once the, the people begin, you know, once the people begin to feel, you know, something was wrong, then everybody was running and bumping into one another. Yeah. How did you get here? I don't know how I came to see him. My mother was all right in the one. And the little children, you know, and taking them out of school, you know, and putting them, some kids, I can't find my mommy, I can't find my mommy, please find. And she wasn't very far. Ronnie, I was looking for you. Where were you? Why did you go away from me? You went, don't do it anymore. Mommy, I love you. Don't go away anymore. 
Don't tell me to go away. Now you stay where I put you. Oh, you have no idea. You have no idea. It's all so sudden, you know. They had to take us all down to the commons. And that was covered with people there all bleeding, and there was some there with their ears <coughs> cut off, and a couple of them there with their eyes hanging down on their cheeks. I'm telling you, it was an awful sight. You could see the, uh, the corpses being brought down on the flat wings down from Richmond, coming down Brum uh, Brumswick Street there, going down to Snow's. And actually, with the, with the bodies, they had dead horses piled on top of the bodies as well. Just over a year after the explosion, on May 1st, 1919, 1,500 Halifax construction workers went out on a six-week general strike against their low pay, terrible living conditions, and the profiteering from war. During the 1930s, the imperialist powers were again in severe economic crisis. Once more, they prepared for war to carve up the world. Big business financed the rise of fascist regimes that committed terror, murder, and aggression. In Canada, the League Against War and Fascism began to organize. Meetings in Halifax were addressed by people such as Dr. Norman Bethune, who urged support of the international movement to stop the fascist takeover in Spain. When the Western governments, including Canada, did nothing to stop the fascists in Spain and elsewhere, Canadians again left Halifax to fight another world war. In 1945, the Nova Scotia government released a film about the role of Halifax in World War II. Other cities may proudly look to their past, but for Halifax, history is always in the making. World War II was, to a dominant degree, a war of supply. But for the tanks, planes, and ships, men were needed. And on the storied cobbles of Halifax, the tramp of armed men beat a savage rhythm. War, 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 war. Forty years after World War II, Halifax Harbor is once again filled with warships. As a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, Canada has become increasingly involved with U.S. imperialist aims in order to expand its own economic interests. During this period, the threat of another, more catastrophic world war seemed both imminent and unthinkable. The rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union for world supremacy fueled armed aggression in Korea, Vietnam, Latin America, Afghanistan, and around the globe. By the early 1980s, Halifax had become a base for the escalating war exercises and visits by American warships. The U.S. Navy's decision to increase the forward deployment of its naval forces directed that several strategic NATO ports, such as Halifax, expand their facilities. The Canadian government spent more than $350 million to modernize CFP Halifax. Now, the Naval Ship Repair Unit could overhaul U.S. and NATO warships. CFB Shearwater, across from Halifax, could berth U.S. nuclear submarines. Tanks, troops, and ships could be rapidly moved to wherever Canadian and U.S. economic interests were threatened. Once again, Halifax was being prepared for war. In the early 1980s, People in Halifax organized demonstrations against the use of the harbor by U.S. and other foreign warships. This is where it is. Can we get around to the road? Can we get around to the road? 
government property. So the government property allows the visits and uh, dockings of all these U.S. warships, but citizens can't uh, demonstrate well, against the danger of war. Entrance, both superpowers. Sir. You're blocking off an entrance. We're not blocking off uh, an entrance. Well, no one is having any problem. Oh, you have to ask the war preparations of both superpowers. We see Canada as having a lot of potential as being a neutral nation, and we believe that uh, as long as we allow Soviet and U.S. ships, warships into our harbor, that that threatens, uh, that threatens Canada and it threatens the world and world peace. The ships which come to Halifax are the ships which menace the coast of Central America, which have menaced the peoples in uh, Indochina, uh, the Middle East, such as the Palestinian people and other peoples. By stopping the ships coming into the port of Halifax, this in a small way will make our contribution to the cause of world peace. It is how we can contribute. On May 1st, 1984, demonstrators protested against the USS Casimir Pulaski, moored in the middle of Halifax Harbor and potentially armed with 16 Trident missiles. The total explosive power of this nuclear submarine's weapons is 1,000 times that of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima and 5,000 times that of the Halifax explosion. They are given the right by the people who are the government, who are our provincial representatives, who are our federal representatives, are tying us in daily to those nuclear submarines to the kind of uh, actions that the U.S. is taking around the world, we are being symbolically implicated. And that was why we were on the streets and saying, no, there's, we will say no to you being in the harbor. We will say no now. This is a similar situation to the Nuremberg, um, what Nuremberg trials brought up, that just because it's suppo legal does not mean that there's any right to this and if there's an obligation to protest this. In 1988, the U.S. aircraft carrier, the Coral Sea, came to Halifax. For once, the Halifax media lifted the mask that these visits are just for rest and recreation when it promoted the Coral Sea's role in the bombing of Libya. The Department of National Defense organized an open house visit for the public and the Dial a Sailor phone line that encouraged Halifax women to escort the American sailors the kind of violence to women in our own streets, the kind of prostitution that comes from, and the, the use of women in our city from rest and relaxation. Not only do American and NATO warships use Halifax Harbor as a base, but Canada sends its own warships from Halifax to join war exercises in Central America and the Caribbean, where Canadian corporations have major investments. In 1981, Canadian warships participated with the U.S. Navy in ocean venture exercises at Vieque Island in Puerto Rico, where a mock invasion was staged just two years before the invasion of Grenada. Isaac Saney is a Caribbean student studying in Halifax. These exercises are not just simply exercises for the fun of it. I mean, they are preludes for concrete actions by the U.S. and by, and which assisted by Canada, when the dictator of the U.S. is actually challenged by any of the islands. We have the clear example of Grenada. We have, um, as I mentioned before, in 1970 in Trinidad, when the warships came and stood off our harbors, when the people were rising up and opposing not, opposing not only the, the injustices in the society, but the imperialist dictate. The U.S. and NATO warships that enter Halifax Harbor also bring another danger of war preparations. June 1, 1990, members of the Coalition for a Nuclear Free Harbor and Greenpeace protested the visit to Halifax of the Ark Royal, a British aircraft carrier armed with nuclear weapons. The issue is that, uh, as a resident of Halifax, I deeply resent the fact that these guys are coming in here, refusing to confirm or deny whether they have weapons on board when everyone knows they do, and trying to deceive the, the Canadian public. They are designed to kill as many people as possible. With, you know, with this little effort, I guess. Um, it's, it's, it's probably the most aggressive thing that anyone can, that exists, are nuclear weapons. The nuclear weapons on board are WE-177, and they have a 20 kiloton uh, capacity for uh, nuclear kill, and that's roughly equivalent to 10 times the Halifax explosion that devastated our city in 1917. We know that these nukes are on board because we're aligned with the North Atlantic Network. 
and this home port of the, the HMS Ark Royal is Portsmouth. And we have people in Portsmouth that have, that have observed the nuclear transport trucks coming and going from the last known docking of the Ark Royal, and that was in uh, March, of eight, March 18. On March 18, they observed the Mammoth Majors, which are the nuclear transport trucks coming from Bergfield, the nuclear weapons facility in England, to the ship and away from the ship. And we know there were nuclear weapons on the ship because they had uh, a uh, transport with them. They had uh, armed personnel carriers, uh, ambulance, fire truck, and uh, a tow truck, just in case the ship broke down. What are you doing, military police? The U.S. Navy has had over 600 nuclear accidents since 1965. Yet the Canadian government for years has facilitated the visits of nuclear-armed and nuclear-powered warships to Canadian ports. It willingly accepts the U.S. policy to neither confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons and to refuse liability for the devastation resulting from an explosion aboard its warships. Some of these nuclear accidents have occurred in harbors similar to Halifax, such as Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Anybody Bunny Bellhumer is a retired Portsmouth shipyard worker. In 1978, he testified before a congressional hearing about the large number of cancer deaths in the shipyard due to radiation exposure that had been covered up by the U.S. government. I had, at the time I testified, I, like I said, I had 275 death certificates, but I showed them, or people just in my shop alone, that there was 40 deaths. I have records here of one of the supervisors that died to compare my radiation exposure to his and his was less than mine and died with leukemia. I have these documents here for anybody's inspection and this is one of the things that I did bring out at the hearing. Were you popular at that hearing? Well I tell you I wasn't very too popular but I felt that I was doing my job as a citizen and looking out for the health problem that, that was in this area. And I feel bad that these other people had died and I feel that the Navy at the time, I know it was new, but they were used as guinea pigs for the radiation exposure at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. And I feel that the people that did die from this exposure, that they should, family should be compensated, which no family yet has been compensated for these diseases. War preparations profoundly influence all aspects of economic, social, and cultural life. Halifax, Dartmouth is now the most heavily militarized area in Canada. 14,000 military personnel and civilian workers are employed at CFB Halifax and CFB Shearwater. Over 200 companies receive American and Canadian military contracts in Nova Scotia. However, it is the largest monopolies such as IMP, Hermes, Lytton and Pratt and & Whitney which receive the lion's share. Pratt & Whitney, whose parent company United Technologies is a huge American military contractor, received a $30 million grant from the Nova Scotia government, plus an additional $8 million to upgrade training facilities at the Nova Scotia Institute of Technology. No no While military spending increased during the 1980s, federal and provincial governments cut back funding to social, health, and educational services. In 1984, hundreds of Halifax High School students demonstrated at the Nova Scotia legislature. We're here for the cutbacks in the school. That's the really main thing. They're taking away a lot of our stuff. They're taking art, the phys ed, the CEP, summer school. They're taking all that away. They're going to screw you. Really to get and you don't need it. We, what are worried, we got to think about other people, right? Not just ourselves. We're all here to fight. How are we supposed to get experience 
We can't even get an education to get that far. Right. Company, and I've looked for summer jobs and I can't find one. I can't even get a job as a stock clerk because I haven't got a, I haven't got enough experience. For the future, they won't even give us money so we can become the future. Who's going right. to run this yeah. In December 1984, the Canadian government sponsored a meeting between Pentagon generals and local businessmen. The stated objective of the Cross-Canada Pentagon tour was to increase the role of Canadian companies as contractors for American arms merchants. Fourteen Nova Scotians who opposed the Pentagon tour were arrested. When I, the police were getting ready to arrest me in that room, Max Reed came and he, he had tied the, previously tied the door together um, so that other protesters couldn't come in with a rope. And um, he went to get the rope, came up to me. I was, I was lying down at the time because they were going to drag me away. And um, he put the rope around my neck. And I, I yelled. I don't know how loudly I yelled or anything like that, but I yelled and he stopped. This is exactly what bringing the Pentagon in is about. At a NATO meeting, Caspar Weinberger, President Reagan's Secretary of Defense, applauded these arrests, saying, this showed the good sense of the people of Nova Scotia. Later, one of those Pentagon contracts went to Selpak Aerospace in Lunenburg on the south shore of Nova Scotia. A friend of ours went to Manpower, and there was this brochure on Selpak, which on the outside looks innocent enough, but as you open it, you see the true nature of the plant, you know, with very graphic pictures of uh, tanks and uh, bombers, etc. you know, like the whole thing is, is like that. And that's their answer for jobs for our youth, you know, to be clan and fodder in the wars that the uh, imperialist powers have for us. And as my, um, my landlady said, that she had been through two depressions and she was afraid we were heading for another one. And I said, two depressions? I don't understand. She said, yes, one before World War I and one before World War II. And she also added later that uh, when they prepare for war, they'll have a war. To disturb the peace of those preparing for war, of course, has brought on the most vicious and barbaric attack on our little group. We faced 16 charges over the past three-year period for disturbing the peace. It is very clear in a society that calls itself democratic and guarantees the freedom of expression that it is the courts, the media, and the agents sent amongst the people who would deny our voices and suppress the struggles of the people, demanding an... The struggles, uh, suppressing the struggles of the peace and demanding an end to the preparations of war, and that the people must organize for a just and lasting peace. As a part of the renewed militarization of Halifax, business, government, and military authorities also promoted the militarization of culture. Military spectacles were organized, such as this one, granting freedom of the city to the Royal Canadian Regiment, who were brought in to suppress the Nova Scotian coal miners' strikes of 1909 and 1910. On this very important day, in this beautiful setting of the Grand Parade with historic St. Paul's on one side and our own City Hall on the other, this has been called a meeting of church and state. Armed Forces Day was expanded from one event to many. The Department of National Defense staged for family entertainment the Shearwater International Air Show that featured American warplanes used to attack Grenada, Libya, and Panama. Throughout the 1980s, the Nova Scotia government, in collaboration with the Department of National Defense, poured millions of dollars into the annual Nova Scotia tattoo. Local dancers, student choirs, and even children's gymnastic groups were enlisted to perform alongside the U.S. Marine Corps and German Air Force bands, amongst others. Pickets were held outside the tattoo beginning in 1983 to protest this glorification of militarism. 
We uh, took a banner, we asked the question, is war entertainment? And around the way, our cultural uh, money, which isn't very much that gets spent on culture in this province anyway, was being put into the um, Nova Scotia tattoo every summer. And the combination of bringing in the U.S. Marines and the Germans and calling them honorary Nova Scotians when they'd been part of what had been going on in the kind of uh, aggression and terrorism in Nicaragua, in Honduras, and around, around the globe. The National Film Board produced military recruiting and propaganda films such as Young Men's Challenge and Nuclear Chemical Warfare, which led to demonstrations outside their Halifax offices. In the most heavily militarized city in Canada, a mass movement against the war preparations developed in the 1980s. When the Trudeau government decided to allow testing of the U.S. cruise missile over Canada, three large demonstrations took place in Halifax. When Prime Minister Trudeau launched his peace initiative, he called for Canadians to stop their mass demonstrations, cooperate with his government, and trust the closed-door negotiations of the superpowers. However, the protests continued. In 1986, the NATO foreign ministers met in Halifax. Many Canadians have called for Canada to get out of NATO as a first step towards peace. Inu representatives came from Labrador to join the anti-NATO rally in Halifax. Their very survival is threatened by Canada's sponsoring of NATO low-level training flights over their land. In her, young, in her younger days, before the military, in her pregnancies, that she never had any problem with her, with her, with her children, especially in labor. Now, the, now today, you see Inu women in a country and get that uh, unexpected loud noise and they really have a problem in uh, having labor. It is very much a human right that is denied the Inu people. And in that denial, Canada and the people of Canada with its name will go down in history that they destroyed a people, a small people, but nevertheless a people such as the Inu. Five years after this rally, the NATO warplane training would be put into practice and Canada would again be involved in a war. August 24, 1990, the Canadian Navy holds a ceremony for the families of over 900 sailors. Three Canadian warships are leaving for the Middle East in support of the U.S.-led blockade of Iraq, which had invaded the Kingdom of Kuwait. Can you stand up, please? What is it? Okay, we're told you had to move back, okay? How far back? There's, I don't know, there's three, there's three camera crews that were slated to be here and you're not one of them. The decision by the Canadian government to send warships to the Persian Gulf was made before either the Canadian Parliament or the United Nations officially endorsed the blockade. O eternal Lord God, who alone spreadest out the heavens and rulest the raging of the seas, who has compassed the waters with bounds until day and night come to an end. Be pleased to receive into thy almighty and most gracious protection the persons of us, thy servants, and the fleet in which we serve. The local media are in the front rows. To them, Halifax has once again come alive. It is the first time in almost 40 years the Canadian Armed Forces are departing Halifax for potential war.
Two days before the departure of the Canadian warships, a picket took place outside the U.S. consulate. We demand that uh, Iraq get out of Kuwait. It has no business occupying Kuwait, and it should withdraw its truth. The main problem, however, is the U.S. is using this for its own sinister aims, for the defense of the oil multinationals, to protect their strategic interests, and to create a vast staging area in the Middle East. Uh, they're using it to exercise dictate, not only over countries such as Canada, but over the countries of the Middle East, the Arab peoples. So any country which today is sending ships to the Middle East is contributing to the military buildup and the possibility of armed intervention by the United States. In response to the danger of war, a number of peace groups and individuals organized a rally in Halifax on Remembrance Day. Saddam Hussein's party was to put into power in Iraq in 1963 with the help of the CIA because the United States wanted to crush the Iraqi Communist Party. U.S., Britain, France, and Canada have all helped to supply Iraq with arms in recent years. One example is the Canadian-made Pratt & Whitney engines and military planes and helicopters supplied to Iraq via Brazil and Italy. It seems a tragic irony to send Canadian ships out of Halifax Harbor to face Iraqi aircraft made with components from Halifax's Aerotech Park. We just decided we would make some phone calls and see what those organizations had to say about it and whether they were willing to come and stand with us today. And we chose today especially for the reason that we wanted to honor and respect those who have died in the, in the past and for those who may very well die in the future. This has really been tearing me apart for the past few days. And today, with all the response and the people who really care, it's given me peace of mind. Not peace of mind, no, not peace of mind, but a much subtler mind on the whole issue. Um, but like, you're not standing alone. Yeah, yeah, I'm not standing alone in this, that's right, yeah. The United Nations was simply side shuffled on the whole thing. The Americans went in there first, and then they went around to convince everybody that this was righteous, and it is not righteous. On November 29, 1990, the United Nations Security Council sanctioned the use of force against Iraq if it did not leave Kuwait by January 15, 1991. Canada voted in favor of the UN resolution, along with Britain, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union, who were all the principal arms sellers in the Gulf region. This Security Council vote showed that the Soviet Union was now facilitating the U.S. New World Order. Just before Christmas, the newly formed Metro Peace Action Network organized an interfaith candlelight vigil, calling for a peaceful resolution to the Gulf crisis. Let us all work for peace. We all have to do our part. Just like one candle by itself doesn't shed too much light, so one person may not make all that big a difference. But put all of our candles together and the light grows stronger so all of us together can indeed create a change. The escalating deployment of armies in the area is definitely a serious threat to peace. With the available weapons of mass destruction on both sides, including chemical, biological, and even tactical nuclear weapons, and with the abuse of high-tech to maximize carnage and destruction, the horrors of war is simply beyond our grasp. Military analysts may debate their estimates. Something is very likely, however, that God forbid should war break on all sides together, the casualties may run into hundreds of thousands killed, including women, children, and other civilians caught in the middle. Many times that number injured, some maimed for life, and the destruction of the infrastructure, the ecology, and the industrial and economic base that is desperately needed in the region. Such a war option is repugnant to the conscience of humanity. On January 12th, the day after the Mulroney government decided to send more troops to the Gulf and the U.S. government prepared for war, 
tens of thousands of people demonstrated in 30 cities across Canada. I think that sanctions may work, but I do not believe we should plunge into war at this point. And what do you think will stop them from making war? I'm not sure at this point whether anything can, but at least I feel an obligation to take some step in that direction. Okay, thanks very much. Can we ask you why you're out here? Sure, because we want to stop the war. Okay, what, what is really upsetting you about it and with it, your daughter here? and The Canadian government has said to be patient with sanctions in South, South Africa, and I wish they would be patient with sanctions in, in Iraq. Thousands of Canadians that are joined in the National Action Day to say no to a Gulf War, to put a stop to the Gulf War. That is why we are here. I want to make something quite clear. Saddam Hussein does not have the right to go into another country and take it over. However, we do not have the right to kill him and hundreds of thousands of people to get him out. Hey, hey, ho, ho. The war has got to go. Hey, hey. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the word of peace through our land. And they'll know we are one by our blood. By our blood, yes, they'll know we are one by our blood. Betty Peterson maintained a noon hour vigil for peace for three months in front of a Halifax library. War is unthinkable, and the Canadian public tires of playing follow the leader after the, after the United States. We kept. <laughs> cannot allow war to happen. Read our lips. No war. <laughs> Reverend Daryl Gray of Nova Scotia worked for several years with the Coalition of Conscience, continuing the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, when Dr. King marched because of segregated schools and public facilities, that was all right. They threw rocks at him, they sick dogs on him, they put water hoses on him, but that was all right, he could deal with that. But the minute, and some people don't realize this, but the minute Dr. King said, we should not send our boys to Vietnam, he was killed. People don't realize that. War is big business. I get very emotional because I'm a veteran. I served nine months in Vietnam. So I'm not coming here telling you what I read. I'm not coming here telling you what somebody else said. I'm coming here because I've seen war. I've seen the blood of war. I've seen the anguish of war. I've seen the pain of war. I've seen the stupidity and the ignorance of war. And I'm here today to say that war doesn't solve anything. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. The Mulroney government immediately announced Canadian participation in the war. I, I walked into the student union last night for a peace meeting and they told me. I felt a giant fist in my stomach. I felt in shock and in mourning and thoroughly depressed. I went all through the stages of grieving. But today, I feel outrage. This is a day of rage. We came here uh, in this area on November 11th to ask our governments to pay attention to what we had to say. We saw this coming as, as they did. And I'm, I'm asking that they listen to this 
message for me. I am mad, we are mad, and we aren't going to take this shit anymore! The terrible torture that was done to the Kuwaiti people. Well, a hell of a lot of torture has been done to people all over the world at the hands of the CIA and people that they trained. So, I, yeah, I guess I'm raging. Like, my father is from Chile, so I come from a different experience of what the Americans did to Chile. And this is, I don't see a big difference. So when George is up there telling me about torture, it makes me want to throw up because he's the king of torture. <laughs> Who are the cowards in this war? Are they the people who protest or the people who are sent off in boats and bravely go leaving their families? Or are they the decision makers on our governments that are afraid to tell the people what the effects of their decisions are having on human beings across the world? And I would pose the, 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 the suggestion that this is where the cowardice li lies in this conflict. Right? And I would We condemn this war wholeheartedly. As students studying in Canada, we believe that um, our commitment to peace and the commitment of you all, to, of the rest of the people out here to peace, is how far we can unite in actions that oppose the Mulroney government in further um, in unraveling us in this unjust war and in the creation of a new world order, the Bush's new world order, that means the control and U.S. dictate on the world scale. Oppose this war! <laughs> This war that's being waged today, killing men, women, and children in the thousands, I am certain, is not about morality or international law or international legality, as Mr. Bush tells us. This war is about power, that the United States must have sole control of the natural resources of the Middle East, the oil and, its, and, and all that goes with it. It is, it is all about exploitation of the third world and taking their resources. This is... I understand that America is directing this war, but I also know that our country has been involved in this kind of imperialist expansion, and we cannot condone that. We want to express our anger and our rage at the Canadian government and the U.S multinational forces in the Gulf. We want to stop this war and we want to be heard. This is the start of it. We didn't expect this many people today. It's time people took back the power that is theirs. There would finally be a ceasefire in the Gulf War, but only after massive destruction by U.S. and coalition bombing that caused casualties estimated as high as 200,000. The ease by which the United States, the United Nations, and our own country went to war makes the danger of future wars even more real. But war is not inevitable. A powerful movement of people is the greatest obstacle to the outbreak of war. It is critical that we continue organizing to stop war preparations right where we live and prevent our government taking us into war again. More than ever now, we must not allow a harbor for war. We are one in the spirit, we are one, we are one in the spirit, we are one, and they'll know we are one by our blood, by our blood, yes they'll know we are one by our blood. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. We will work for our dignity, for all humankind. And they'll know we are one by our blood, by our blood. Yes, they'll know we are one by our blood. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk 
hand in hand, and together we'll spread the word of peace through our land, and they'll know we are one by our blood, by our blood. Yes, they'll know we are one by our blood.